Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, in the present session, I have come with the topic, the concept of natural justice. In earlier lecture, I discussed the administrative adjudicatory powers of the administration and the last part of lecture was relating to the procedure to be followed by the administrative adjudicatory bodies in exercising the decision making. And I referred to the principles of natural justice there. So, what is the concept of natural justice? What is the meaning of natural justice? And what are the different rules or principles of natural justice? We will discuss in this session. The concept of natural justice, we know that there is no general law in India to regulate the procedure of administrative adjudication. And therefore, we are dependent on the parent act whether it provides for any particular procedure or not. The parent act may provide for this procedure or it leaves it for the discretion of the administrative authority to devise its own procedure. The administrative authority in deciding its own procedure may take into consideration only the convenience of administrative body, only the administrative convenience and it may ignore the fairness to the people. And therefore, there are two issues relating to the procedure of administrative adjudicatory processes. Number one, there is a bewildering variety of administrative procedure to be followed by administrative adjudicatory bodies. And number two, there may be some times when the administrative adjudicatory authority itself devising the procedure it may ignore the fairness to the individuals. We also know that administrative law is the law to strike the balance between these two opposite ends, these two opposite claims. At one end, the administrative convenience, the administrative efficacy and on the other hand, the fairness to the individual. And therefore, the courts have already always insisted on the minimum fair procedure to be followed by the administrative bodies. The minimum fair procedure is the procedure which is required to be followed by the authorities to make the procedure to make the proceedings fair. And this minimum fair procedure refers to the principles of natural justice. The courts has always insisted on the minimum fair procedure and minimum fair procedure refers to the principles of natural justice, then it becomes important to study what are the principles of natural justice and how they emerged out. For better understanding to the concept of natural justice and its application to the administrative decision making process, we can divide our study into two parts, the meaning and concept of principles of natural justice and number two two fundamental rules of natural justice and their application. Friends, the natural justice is the developing concept and it is not contained in any codified canons. It is very difficult and not possible to define the natural justice. In the case of Award versus Sullivan, which was decided in 1952 by the King's Bench Court of England, the court observed that principles of natural justice are easy to proclaim, but precise extent is far less easy to define. In ancient times, natural justice was being used interchangeably with natural law and in its modern meaning, the meaning of the term natural justice is restricted to refer certain rules of judicial procedure. The concept of justice is very elaborate and elegant in nature and therefore, the meaning and the concept of natural justice is 
very significant and important. This concept is not new. It is as old as the civilization itself and it has been developed with the growth of civilization. In the case of K.I. Shefford versus Union of India, the Supreme Court of India observes that the rules of natural justice have grown and evolved with the growth of civilization and their content is considered as the measure of the standard of civilization and the level of rule of law in any society. By this we can understand the origin of the principles of natural justice that principles of natural justice are grown are developed with the growth of civilization and these are as old as the civilization itself. In the Union of India versus Tulsi Ram Patel, the Supreme Court explained the meaning of principles of natural justice by observing that the principles of natural justice or the natural justice is not the justice of nature. Natural justice is not the justice of nature where the lion consumes the lamb and the tiger fodders upon the antelope. Natural justice is the higher law of nature or natural law where the lion and the lamb settle down together and the tiger plays and dances with the antelope. Thus, the natural justice represents the ideal situation of rule of law where there is no discrimination on the basis of rich and poor, on the basis of strong and weak, on the basis of the literate or illiterate, on the basis of backward and forward. On these many bases, it prevents the discrimination. This is the natural justice and thus the natural justice refers to the fairness, the reasonableness, the even handedness, the impartiality, the equity and the equality. The great Indian philosopher, the most popular political leader and the distinguished social reformer Mahatma Gandhi also imagined such ideal situation in the form of Ram Raj. He described his Ram Raj to mean divine Raj, the kingdom of God. He acknowledged the only God that is the God of truth and righteousness. He explained the Ram Raj as he says. Whether Ram of my imagination ever lived or not on this earth, the ancient ideal of Ram Raj is undoubtedly one of the true democracy in which the meanest citizen could be sure of swift justice without an elaborate and costly procedure. Ram Raj of my dream ensures equal rights of prince and pauper. Gandhiji made this statement when he was writing in Amrit Vajar Patrika and in Young India Patrika in 1929 and in 1934. Mahatma Gandhi further says that this imagination of Ram Raj is the ideal situation of the natural justice where the rights of prince and pauper are equal and therefore it seems that this imagination of Mahatma Gandhi is the manifestation of the beautiful description of Ram Raj by great Indian saint and poet Goswami Tulsi Das Ji in Uttar Kanda of Ram Charit Manas. When he writes that Ram Raj Vaithe Trai Loka Harsit Bhaye Gaye Shab Soka Bayar Unakar Kahu San Koi There was no element of enmity. Bayarunakar kahu san koi, Ram Pratap Vishamta koi. There was the state of equality, inequality was not there. Bayarunakar kahu san koi, Ram Pratap Vishamta koi, Daihik Daivik Bhautik Tapa, Ram Raj Nai Kahu Kavyapa, Savanar Karahi Paraspar Preeti. There was the feeling of brotherhood. Savanar Karahi Paraspar Preeti, Chalahi Sudharma Nirat Srut Niti, meaning thereby the law abiding society was there. There was no violation of rules and regulations and law. He further says that Khagamara Gasavasav Nana Vranda Avay Charai Vana Karai Ananda, meaning thereby that the words and the deers, they, they, they are playing with them in uh, the jungle and Therefore, there was no sense of fearness, 
there was no sense of enmity all were equal he also says that gaj and panchanan lion and the elephants they were also wandering with them they were also playing with them and it can be possible only in ideal situation which was imagined by mahatma gandhi and which was detailed or explained by the supreme court of india in tulsi ram patel that natural justice is not the justice of nature where the lion consumes the lamb or tiger feeds upon the antelope whereas the natural justice is an ideal situation of rule of law where lion and lamb lie together and where the tiger frisked with the antelope the tiger plays with dances with the antelope this is the imagination of mahatma gandhi which seems to be the manifestation of this great description by goswami tulsidas ji of ram raj in ram charit manas the ideal of procedure procedural fairness the meaning of the natural justice it refers to the procedural fairness and this ideal of procedural fairness has been an essential and vital part of our cultural heritage and therefore it is deeply rooted in our law in indian law france though it is alleged that the principles of natural justice are systematized in ancient rome in the form of just naturally yet the basic norms of natural justice were very well recognized in our ancient indian tradition in our ancient legal practices under the ancient indian moral ethical and legal code dharma the earliest duty of the judge or king was his integrity including absolute absence of bias or attachment we know that the principles of ritual justice refers to fundamental rules the rule against bias and rule of audi ultram partum the rule against bias and the rule of hearing these are two fundamental rules of natural justice and our ancient literature talks about dharma and dharma refers to the procedural fairness or dharma refers to the absolute absence of bias or the attachment natural justice in its modern meaning refers to the higher procedural courts and standards developed by the judges which each administrative authority must follow during the exercise of administrative adjudicatory powers english and indian courts also interpreted the term natural justice in different cases decided by the english courts and decided by the indian courts the natural justice was explained the natural justice the term natural justice was interpreted according to these decisions natural justice refers to or the natural justice means the common sense justice justice which is based on the common sense natural justice refers to the common fairness the natural justice refers to the duty to act fairly the natural justice refers to the sense of what is right and what is wrong natural justice means the fair play in action and natural justice means the common sense justice or the fundamental justice these are the different meanings attributed to the term natural justice by the english courts in different decisions when the natural justice is the common sense justice it means it don't have anything to do with the codified law or codified canons it is the justice which is based on the common sense of the people it is the justice which is based on the common thoughts or common human values it is the justice which is based on the human conscience it is the justice which is based on the human mythology and therefore the natural justice is the common sense justice natural justice is also the sense of what is right and what is wrong it also differentiates with the formal procedure of judiciary or formal procedure of judicial functioning when natural justice is a common sense justice or natural justice is a sense of what is wrong and what is right again it is dependent of 
the basic human values. It is dependent of the human conscience and therefore it is said that natural justice is not the codified canons. Natural justice under the regime of natural justice, the justice is based on the human values and human ethos. ethos. Natural justice is the fair play in action. This fair play in action was this term was used by the House of Lords in the case of Ridge versus Waldwin. And we must also remind that this term fair play in action to mean natural justice was also adopted by our Supreme Court in the case of Menka Gandhi. When the Supreme Court says that it is not necessary, it is not sufficient for any law to be constitutional that it has been made by the competent legislature by following the prescribed procedure, whereas the law should also have the reasonability, the justness, the fairness. So, any law when it is enacted by the competent legislature, in addition to this requirement, it requires the reasonableness, fairness and justness. Even if the law has been enacted by the competent legislature, it cannot be constitutional unless it is ingrained with the basic spirit of or these fundamentals of natural justice, the justness, fairness and reasonableness. The Indian Supreme Court in the case of Canra Bank versus Devasis Das, which was decided in 2003. The Supreme Court of India explained the term natural justice in very detail. When the Supreme Court was explaining the meaning of natural justice in Canra Bank versus Devasis Das case, the Supreme Court was of the opinion that the rules of natural justice are not codified canons. The explanation which was given by the Supreme Court of India to the term natural justice in the case of Canra Bank has some features, important features or characteristics or some important aspects. Natural justice means that it is not the, the rules of natural justice are not codified canons. Number two, the justice based on natural justice is based on the basic human values, the basic human ethos, the basic human conscience. The Supreme Court in Canra Bank case says that the objective of both the legal justice and the natural justice is same. And what is this objective? To achieve the substance of justice is the objective of both the legal justice and the natural justice. But when the legal justice fails to achieve this objective, to achieve the substance of justice, then the natural justice comes forward to assist the natural justice in achieving this great and holy goal or the objective that is achieving the substance of justice. This is the explanation given by the Supreme Court of India to the term natural justice in Canra Bank case. When the Supreme Court says that the natural justice is the justice which comes in add, which comes in assistance to the legal justice in the event of the situation where the legal justice fails to achieve its solemn objective that is achieving the substance of justice, then it refers to the situation in India in two cases, A.K. Gopalan and then Menka Gandhi. In A.K. Gopalan case, the Supreme Court says that the individuals or the citizens, they do not have any claim against the executive. The procedure established by law under Article 21, friends, under Article 21 of Indian Constitution, it is provided that the personal liberty and life, the, the, the Article 21 states that no person shall be deprived of his right to life and personal liberty except by the procedure established by law. And therefore, there was the requirement to explain the procedure of law, what does it mean? In a Gopalan case, the Supreme Court says 
that the procedure established by law would mean the procedure as laid down by the competent legislature. Once it is laid down by the competent legislature, it is the procedure established by law. No matter this procedure is arbitrary, this procedure is discriminatory, this procedure is very rigid or inflexible, it does not matter if it is enacted by, if it is laid down by the competent legislature, it would mean the procedure established by law for the purpose of article 21 and anybody can be deprived of his right to life and personal liberty by this procedure laid down by the competent legislature. The Supreme Court was of the opinion that the, the, the person, the individual does not have any claim against the executive. When executive applies any such procedure which has been established by law, you have the claim against the remedy against the executive, but you do not have the remedy against the legislature. Legislature, if legislature is making any law, it is the procedure established by law. But when the Supreme Court re-examined this observation or this decision, judgment in Menka Gandhi case, the Supreme Court reached to the conclusion that no, it is not sufficient for any procedure to be the procedure established by law for the purpose of article 21 that it is enacted by a competent legislature. In addition to this, it requires to be just, fair and reasonable. This is the difference between the legal justice and natural justice. The decision of A.K. Gopalan case represents the situation of legal justice whereas the decision in Menka Gandhi case represents the situation of natural justice where natural justice comes forward to assist the legal justice when legal justice failed to achieve the substance of justice in the case of A.K. Gopalan. This is the meaning of natural justice in accordance with the Supreme Court of India in Canra Bank versus Devasis Das case. If we see the status of natural justice in our constitution, the natural justice has been ingrained in Indian constitution by both the express provisions and by the implied constitutional principles. Article 14 is the great example. It is the repository of the principles of natural justice because Article 14 protects against the arbitrariness. Article 14 provides for the reasonable classification. Article 14 protects or it provides for the equity or equality. There are two aspects of Article 14 of Indian Constitution. One, the equality before law and number two, the equal protection of laws. By the equality before law and by the equal, equal protection of laws, the article 14 becomes the source of the principles of natural justice because it provides for the equity and the equality. You can refer the case of E.P. Royappa versus state of Tamil Nadu, wherein the Supreme Court says that the article 14 protects also against the arbitrariness or arbitrary exercise of power. If you see the objective of principles of natural justice, these principles of natural justice were thought of or they are realized the, the, the need for having minimum fair procedure in the form of natural justice with an objective to check the arbitrariness in the governmental functioning, particularly in the area of administrative adjudication, so that without following the minimum fair procedure, the authorities cannot give the decisions, the authorities cannot exercise the decision making powers. And therefore, again article 14 represents the principles of natural justice. We can also refer again the case of Menka Gandhi versus Union of India, where the Supreme Court says that for any law, for any procedure to be the procedure established by law under Article 21 needs to be fair, just and reasonable. It needs to be fulfilled with or it needs to be ingrained with the principles of natural justice. 
again article 14 is the status of article the status of principles of natural justice we can see in our constitution. Article 13 can also be referred wherein the state is prevented to make any law which in any way takes away the fundamental rights. Friends, if violation of article 14 or the violation of article 21 as observed by the Supreme Court of India not only in E. P. Royappa or Menka Gandhi case whereas in many cases if the violation of principles of principal justice is the violation of article 14 and article 21 then certainly the violation of article 13 also becomes the violation of principles of principal justice because violating article 13 clause 2 the state violates the fundamental rights of the citizens including the rights under article 14 and 21. We can also refer to section 300 article 311 particularly clause 2 of article 311 of Indian constitution wherein the principles of mutual justice are included with in express terms. Article 300 clause 2 provides no civil servant of union or state shall be removed or reduced in rank except after an inquiry in which he has been informed of the charges against him and given a reasonable opportunity of being heard in respect of those, those charges. There are two important aspects of this article 311 clause 2. Number one that no civil servant can be removed or reduced from his rank except after an inquiry in which he has been informed of the charges against him. Meaning thereby that every civil servant has the right to know the charges against him if he is going to be removed on those charges. Under the principles of ritual justice, there are two rules, rule against bias and rule of audi ultram partum or rule of hearing. And within the rule of hearing, there are many stages, many components of hearing. Among those stages, one stage is where the person or the party to the case is entitled to make out his or her own case to present the evidence in his favor. And this component or this stage of hearing gives worth to one right to the party to the case that the, the parties to the case have the right to know the evidence. If and the second one is that that party is also entitled to revert the evidence. The knowing of the evidence and the revital of the evidence or the contradiction of the adverse material, these have very close connection. Without knowing the evidence against a person, that person cannot be capable of contradicting the adverse material or the adverse evidence or the evidence against him. Without knowing the evidence, that person may not be capable of to explain his own case and therefore, these requirements of natural justice are ingrained in clause 2 of article 311 of our constitution. As I told you that the study, the discussion over the principles of natural justice is divided into two parts. Number one, the meaning and the concept of natural justice and number two, two fundamental rules of natural justice. And the application of these rules in the administrative decision making. The first part we discussed the concept of natural justice, the meaning of natural justice wherein we found that the concept of natural justice is not new, it is, it is as old as the civilization itself and in Indian situation, in the earlier part we discussed that or we concluded that the concept of natural justice is not new, it is as old as the civilization itself and it has grown, it has developed with the development or the growth of civilization. As Justice Rangnath Mishra ji very rightly observed 
that the content of natural justice it is the measure of the standard of the rule of standard of the civilization and the level of rule of law in any society meaning thereby that as the civilization develops the natural justice the principles of natural justice the standards of natural justice they also develop side by side with the development of the civilization we also knew the fact that natural justice cannot be defined precisely it has many meanings we also have seen the status of principles of natural justice in indian constitution then in the next part the second part of our discussion we will discuss on two fundamental rules of principles of natural justice these two fundamental roots are number 1 the rule against bias and number 2 the rule of ordi ultram partum rule against bias is the first rule of principles of natural justice which is based on two important principles it is represented by one maxim nemo judex in kaja sua this nemo judex in kaja sua means that nobody should be made judge in his own cause nobody can be made judge in his own case this rule against bias is based on two important principles two important basic fundamental thoughts number 1 that nobody should be made judge in his own case no person can be allowed no person may be allowed to be the judge for his own case in his own cause and number 2 the justice should not only be done but it should also be seen to be done undoubtedly manifestly it should be seen to be done why it is required that justice should not only be done but it should also undoubtedly manifestly seen to be done it is required to maintain the confidence in justice delivery system in the administration of justice of any state of any country because the judiciary the courts are the last resort to anybody if a person is disappointed from all the corners then he has the hope to receive the justice from the chambers of the courts and therefore it is very important to maintain to develop to make sound the confidence in the public confidence in the people to this justice delivery system and this confidence can be maintained only when the public the people they will see that justice is done and therefore the rule against bias is based on two principles that nobody should be the judge in his own cause and number 2 the justice should not only be done but it should also be seen to be done what is the meaning of bias before going to the details of rule against bias we should also understand the meaning of bias the meaning of bias what is bias we must have heard about the term the word prejudice prejudice means the preconceived ideas preconceived notions preconceived thought about anybody or about anything when this preconceived notion when this preconceived idea when this preconceived thought is operated in the decision making process and it makes the judge to decide the case on the basis of some extraneous considerations by ignoring the evidence or the material before him before it then it is a state of bias 
it means that bias is the operative prejudice and this prejudice or this bias arises out of different kinds of affiliations or associations of the decision maker either with the parties to the case or with the subject matter of the case on the basis of these different kinds of associations or the connections of the decision maker either with the parties or with the subject matter of the case this bias or rule against bias under the rule against bias the bias is divided into many categories several categories before going through the different kinds of bias it is also relevant for us to know two important tests which are to be applicable in the cases of bias by the courts these two tests are reasonable suspicion of bias test and number 2 the real likelihood of bias test the real suspicion of bias test when it is applied by the courts in deciding any case of bias the court applies the outward considerations in determining the case the court does not apply the inward considerations what are inward considerations what are outward considerations friends the inward considerations are the evidence before the court the material produced by the parties before the court these are the inward considerations outward considerations are the opinion of the general public or particularly the opinion of the reasonable persons of the society the opinion of the persons of average mind it means that when the court applies the reasonable suspicion of bias test to the cases of bias it decide the cases not on the basis of the evidence or the material before it but it decide the case on the basis of the opinion of the right minded persons of the society the opinion of the reasonable persons of the society if in a given situation the reasonable persons of the society the right minded persons of the society they have the apprehension they have the doubt they have the suspicion in their mind as to the existence of the bias on the part of the decision maker then that decision maker becomes disqualified to make the decision and therefore this rule against bias can also be said to be rule of disqualification the rule against bias disqualify the decision maker on the basis of bias if the decision maker is found to be biased then he is disqualified to make the decision and if he has already made the decision then the decision being made by that person or that decision maker that adjudicator that judge becomes invalid or unconstitutional so that this rule against bias is the rule of disqualification it makes the decision maker the adjudicator or the judge disqualified if he is found guilty of bias under the reasonable suspicion of bias test it is sufficient for declaring any adjudicator to be disqualified if the reasonable persons of the society the right minded persons of the society they have the suspicion or they suspects they have the doubt as to the impartiality of that person as to the fairness of that person as to the unbiasedness of that person in making the decision and therefore i say that in reasonable suspicion of bias test the, the the court applies the outward considerations whereas in real likelihood of bias test the court applies the inward considerations meaning thereby the evidence or the material before it it does not affect at decision with respect to the opinion of the right minded persons of the society 
it does not affect its decision with reference to the outward considerations whereas it applies strictly the inward considerations and try to find out whether there is sufficient material there the, there is the substantive material to prove the bias on the part of the decision maker these are the two test and these two tests are applied in two different sets of cases in the cases of personal bias and pecuniary bias the reasonable suspicion of bias test is applicable in the cases of subject matter bias official bias departmental bias the rule of real likelihood of bias is applicable there are many kinds of bias the personal bias pecuniary bias subject matter bias partiality or the connection with the issue official bias pre utterances or pre determination of issues acting under dictation the personal bias arises out of the personal relationship or the personal connection of the decision maker with the parties or the subject matter we can understand it by referring a case mineral development corporation limited versus state of bihar in this case lease license was issued for a coal mine for 99 years to the owner of mineral development corporation limited but after some years a notice was served by the department of revenue the owner of mineral development corporation replied the notice and denied all the allegations but after 2 years of this reply the license was cancelled one more important fact was there that the owner of mineral development corporation limited that is raja kamakya prasad singh he was the contestant in general assembly elections in 1952 against the present minister to the department of revenue he was not only the contestant but some cases were also filed by the minister against the raja kamakya prasad and these cases were transferred from the high court of bihar to delhi on the basis of the political rivalry in these two when these facts came to the supreme court the supreme court quashed the decision on the basis of personal bias the test of reasonable suspicion of bias was applied by the court and quashed the decision made by the department of revenue to cancel the license whether there was actual bias or not that was not the matter of inquiry of the court court decides on the basis of outward considerations that is the reasonable suspicion in the minds of the right minded persons of the society in the pecuniary bias also the same kind of approach is applicable by the courts and this pecuniary bias arises out of the financial interest of economic interest of the decision maker in the subject matter or in any part to the case howsoever small this interest may be but the decision maker is always disqualified if it is proved that he has any financial or economic interest or financial or economic connection either to the parties to the case or to the subject matter of the case subject matter bias may further be divided into four categories partiality or connection with the issue number 2 official or departmental bias number 3 pre utterances or pre determination of issues and acting under dictation these are the four sub kinds of the subject matter bias in partiality or connection with the issue there is always the necessity to the requirement to establish very close and real connection between the adjudicator and the parties or the subject matter of the case for example if a magistrate is the subscriber to a royal society which royal society works for the prevention of cruelty against the animals and this society 
prosecutes a person for the instance of cruelty against a horse against any animal and magistrate decides on this matter when the matter is challenged the court says no magistrate is not disqualify to decide the case on the basis that magistrate was merely the subscriber to the society magistrate was in no way connected to the process of prosecution the magistrate did not have any control on the process of prosecution to be made by the society and therefore the court did not find any real or close connection we can also take the illustration that if an election tribunal is constituted and the chairman of election tribunal is the husband of the member of congress party or any political party the appointment of that person as the chairman of election tribunal is challenged on the basis that his wife is the member of a particular political party and the petitioner in this case defeated the candidate of the same party to whom the wife of the chairman of election tribunal belongs the court says that no there is no real connection there is no close connection of the decision maker either with the parties or the subject matter of the issue and therefore the rule against bias cannot be applied he cannot be declared to be disqualified person when the decision maker will be declared to be disqualified in such a situation the court answers that if the real and close connection is found only then or is proved only then he will be declared to be disqualified and this may happen if the decision maker is acting in several capacities like he is acting in the capacity of prosecutor and in the capacity of judge he is acting in the capacity of complainant and in the capacity of judge he is acting in the capacity of witness and in the capacity of judge you can take the illustration of nu versus state of up in nu case the inquiry officer who was conducting the inquiry against a person he left the inquiry and came stepped into the witness box gave the evidence against the person against whom he was conducting the inquiry then again he resumed the inquiry and the gave and, and gave the decision against that person the supreme court of india in this case quashed the decision by the inquiry officer on the basis that the inquiry officer is acting in both the capacity as the witness and the judge so when the real and close connection is found only then the decision maker is declared to be disqualified official bias or the departmental bias again the the the, the approach of real likelihood of bias is applied not the reasonable suspicion of bias the supreme court says that unless it is found that there is the substantial material to prove the bias on the part of the decision maker he cannot be declared to be disqualified only on the basis that he is the part and parcel of the government in the cases of official bias in the cases of departmental bias we always see that the hearing is made or the decisions are being made by the members or the officials of the same department against whom the objections are raised the objections are heard by objections are decided by the officials of the same department and therefore there is always the apprehension there is always the doubt there is always the suspicion in the minds of the reasonable persons of the society that they will be biased
and that is the reason that only for such a suspicion only for such an assumption the official cannot be declared to be biased or he cannot be disqualified otherwise if we apply this test to the official or departmental bias there cannot be the administrative adjudication unless we make the arrangement like americans they appoints the independent hearing officers who are not connected or who are not working under the control of any department but in india we don't have any such arrangement therefore in the cases of official bias and departmental bias we cannot apply the test of reasonable suspicion of bias and the test of real likelihood of bias was applied you can refer to the cases like gulapalli nageswar rao versus state of tamil nadu kundala rao versus state of tamil nadu can also be referred to wherein the court says that only for the region that the hearing officer the decision maker is the part and parcel of the government or the office he cannot be held disqualified unless and until there is the sufficient or substantial material to prove the bias on the decision maker the same approach is applied regarding pre utterances or pre determination of issues and acting under dictation in pre utterances or pre determination of issues we see that sometimes the ministers or the officials of the departments they declare the policies beforehand then the question arises when they declare the policies beforehand or the policies which they wish to introduce or to launch in future then only on the basis of these statements by them if they are disqualified to hear the objections against the same policies whether they have the four closed mind to hear the objections the supreme court of india has been of opinion that no only the pre utterances or the prior statements does not make the officials disqualified to hear the objections unless their mind is four closed to hear the objections if they hear the objections they considers the objections and if the circumstance is such that they are not giving due considerations to the objections raised by the people raised by the objectors and they decide the case only on the basis of the considerations of the policy then they can be declared to be disqualified but it is required to prove that they are hearing with their four closed mind that is the condition precedent so again here it is required that there must be some substantial material to prove the bias on the part of the decision maker the same principle is applicable to the situation where the decision maker is acting under dictation the second important rule of principles of natural justice is audi ultram partum or rule of hearing this audi ultram partum or the rule of hearing is the code of judicial procedure involving several stages and every stage giving rise to the right to the parties to case the justification behind the rule of hearing is nobody can be condemned unheard the adjudicatory authority is not allowed to give the decision without providing adequate and sufficient opportunity of hearing every party to the case should be given the maximum opportunity to explain his or her case and to produce the evidence and material in his or her favor it is also very important that the party to the case must also be given the sufficient opportunity to contradict or rebut the adverse evidence or material there are different or several components of the hearing as i told you that rule of hearing or audi ultra partum is a code of judicial procedure it involves many stages each and every stage refers to the different or several components of hearing and each components gives rise to the different right to the parties for example the first stage of hearing is notice notice gives rise to the parties the parties have the right to notice without giving the notice nobody can be punished 
no action can be taken by the administrative authority no decision can be made by the administrative adjudicatory authority without giving the notice to the concerned parties and that notice must be adequate and sufficient to be sufficient and adequate the notice must include at least the time date and place of hearing the name and address of the administrative adjudicatory body before which the hearing is to be held and number 3 the specific charges which has been made against that person the second is the supply of adverse evidence it is the right of the parties to the case to have or to receive the evidence against them because in the absence of this they will not be in position to explain their own case or to contradict the evidence against them opportunity to present the favorable evidence it is also the right to the parties to the case that they will be given the opportunity by the administrative authority to present their own case this may be by oral hearings or written submissions it depends on the circumstances whether oral hearings are needed or not because the principles of principle justice represent the minimum fair procedure in a given circumstance and therefore if the circumstances demand then only the oral hearings becomes essential written submissions if the party is capable of explaining his or her case sufficiently then only the written submissions are sufficient then the next stage of hearing is opportunity to rebut the adverse material and it involves two stages the cross examination and legal representation the cross examination is allowed only in the situation where it is mandatory for the authority or it is provided by the enactment or the circumstances exist the shows the need of the cross examination only in the circumstance where the oral hearings are involved where the expert evidence is on record where the person concerned is illiterate where the question of law is involved the cross examination becomes necessary then the legal representation if the party is not capable of explaining his or her case by its own efforts or it cannot explain it by itself then it is the mandatory requirement for the authority to provide the legal representation to the party concerned it is also the rule of part of the rule of hearing or one rule under the ordeal term partum that one who hears must decide one person who hears must decide because only he can understand the claims of both the parties and it is the rule but with respect to the institutional decisions this rule cannot be applied and therefore the institutional decisions are considered to the exception to this where the authorship of the decision cannot be known it is also the rule under ordeal term partum that evidence shall not be taken on the back of the party it is required that evidence shall be taken only in the presence of the party itself and if the evidence is taken on the back of the party or in the absence of the party then it is also the obligation over the authority to communicate the party about this evidence and to give the sufficient opportunity to the party concerned to contradict evidence so it depends on the circumstances because the principles of principle justice these are not inflexible rules these are sufficiently flexible to be applied in accordance with the need of circumstances it is also the rule that the inquiry report shall be shown to the party concerned particularly when the decision maker base the emphasizes or the decision maker relies on the inquiry report and he makes this inquiry report as the basis of his decision then it is mandatory for the authority to communicate to provide the report of inquiry to the concerned party these are all the different aspects of rule of hearing and all these aspects of rule are hearing rule of hearing are applicable in accordance with the need of the circumstances and this is also the region for which the natural justice is known as the circumstantial justice in a given circumstance what minimum is required to make the proceedings fair that should be followed by the administrative authorities
oral hearings may not be followed, may the opportunity of oral hearings may not be given by the administrative adjudicatory authority. If only by written submissions the person can explain his own case. But if the situation is such where without providing the oral hearings, he cannot explain his own case, then it becomes mandatory for the authority to give the oral hearings. For example, that if there is the issue of the age of high court judge, president decides and he denies for oral hearings, then it, it may not be considered to be the violation of principles of natural justice because oral hearings are not required for that person or high court judge to explain his case. Only the written submissions are sufficient, only the documentary evidences are sufficient to prove the age of the high court judge. So, in accordance with the need of circumstances, these principles of natural justice, these principles of fairness, equity and equality are to be applied by the administrative adjudicatory authority and if the administrative adjudicatory authorities apply or adopt or follow these minimum fair procedures in the form of natural justice, then certainly the objective of administrative law to strike the balance between the administrative convenience, administrative efficacy and fair, fairness to the individual may be achieved. Thank you very much. Thank you.